So welcome, Matt, Matt Ryan, to the Keen on Yoga podcast and YouTube. Um, nice to have you. It's nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's great to finally uh, meet you. I've heard about you for so many years, and uh, I guess I've All bad part. Bad. No, <laughs> not at all, not at all. Um, so, I mean, just give it, just give me an update on how you kind of got into the yoga in the first place. Because I know you've got an interesting story. Well, I guess the interesting part of it really is that I, you know, I used to work, I used to be a DJ. <clears throat> mm. um, you know, this was Manchester late eighties, early nineties. And, you know, doing all the things that you do when you're a DJ, <laughs> staying up yeah. late, party, partying and, you know, excesses of that. And I, um, mm. yeah, I started to, um, I started to, to kind of feel strange and I couldn't kind of put my finger on it. And then basically I, I had, you know, I think what was the, the catalyst, I had this big panic attack. Right. And then quite quickly, these strange feelings became really bad really acute and yeah and these strange feelings in time i learned were this diagnosis depersonalization um which i guess we can talk about shortly but you know i yeah, started yeah. to feel kind of really really weird kind of like mm. I, I couldn't really put my finger on it but it was you know it was pretty dreadful i didn't feel a, like a real person you know mm. and um yeah so what 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 basically happened is i um i was reaching out to to friends and family you know see if anyone could help me went to doctors had some you know i got prescribed antipsychotics antidepressants hmm. and then I, you know i was kind of getting looking at like things like reflexology and even flower essences you know it was that awful yeah. i was basically yeah, yeah. throwing the kitchen sink of um you know, mm. of, of ways to, to, to help it or to make it become less. Mm, and mm. what happened is that one of the, um, the, the one of the people who worked in the, in, in the nightclub that I was DJing, DJing at said, oh, you know, why don't you try yoga? You know, and at the time, I'm, you know, I, I'm like, you know, what, what, what's that? I kind of had a vague idea of what yoga was, right? Um, and she gave me the number of this 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 guy uh, in a place called Withington in in in, in Manchester in the Burbs. And I went along mm. to this class and um, hated it, you know, because it was prime uh, prime series, right? I guess. Who who was uh, it? A guy called Mike Nevitt. Yeah, I thought it might be. I know Mike. Great, uh, great. Oh, guy. do you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. I was, I mean, was, I was, I was, Does he live in? Norway now for, or somewhere. For, I, oh, I haven't heard from him for years, but he was very an interesting guy, right? Like, and, and unfortunately, never really kind of made it into the general kind of public knowledge, as it were. But we're a great teacher. I, yeah. Yeah, he naffed off to Norway, I think. He hooked up with some lass in Norway and, yeah, he camped there. I think uh, it was Norway. I went to teach with him in, was it Norway? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> anyway. Right, our okay. House. Is our yeah. house in Norway? In a place yes, called yes, I, yes. Yes. I think so. Yes. So we, we we did a work. Well, he did a workshop there, and I assisted him. And yeah, he uh, he met somebody there, and I think he, he never went back. <laughs> and uh, he went back to Manchester. Anyway, where were we? So yeah, I, I went along to this yep. class, hated it, and you know, I, I had no idea what got me back the week later. But I went back the week later, and you know, mm -hmm. slowly kind of couple of weeks in, I was starting to get a little bit of the hang of it. You know, I, I've um, I've always been fairly, you know, fit. I've played a lot of football and, mm. you know, I used to run a lot. <clears throat> and, um, yeah, so I kind of got over the um, the kind of physicality of it. And, um, yeah, I, I guess it may be the, the best part of, of two months before I started to feel any kind of, you know, benefit. Mm. Maybe not two months, maybe kind of a month, six weeks. In, in, in that... I felt for the first time, ah, here's something. You know, the antipsychotics didn't work, the antidepressants didn't work, the flower essences, the reflex. Mm. You know, none of these things were particularly working. But ha, ah, I've got something I can I, I can put my finger on that is helping. It's helping right. me physically. It's kind of helping helping my mind. It's helping these this condition yeah. kind of you know become less. You know, how old were you then? Um, twenty nine. Okay, right. So you came yeah, to it quite 29. late, quite late in a way. Sure. Yeah. 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 And you were well, no, and you're you know, working. You're working as sorry. a professional DJ all that time. Before that, you're working and getting. You know, that was your living, right? As a DJ. Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. And you got pretty. Um, you know, you got you're pretty um, 
pretty high up there. You playing at the Hacienda, weren't you? So you know you were you were high up, <laughs> yeah. high up in that game. And you yeah. and you you know it's not what you know, it's who you know, Adam. <laughs> right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. and so you know, friends in high places. Anyway. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, you know, I, I, back to the yoga thing. Um, yeah. I had you know I had no real concept or idea that you know what it was really. Even when I was practicing a good couple of weeks, and I remember. You know, a friend of mine had said, you know, what yoga is it? And I'm like, oh, let's go and ask Mike. I said, what, Mike, what, what is this yoga? It's a shanti yoga. I'm like, okay, <laughs> great. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, I, I guess a couple of months in, I started to kind of do a little bit of digging. I think the internet was out at that point. I think it was plug-in internet. There was no Wi-Fi, you know. Yeah, yeah. I found out, you know, this practice comes from Mysore, South India, you know, and it felt like, I, I, I don't know the time frames really, but it felt quite a short period of time before, like, right, boom, I'm hanging up my headphones and I'm getting off to India. I'm, you know, I'm going to really immerse myself in this practice, which is basically, you know, sorting my mind and body out. And, you know, when I, I knocked off mm. to India, I think this was like 2000, January 2000. And I went for right. January and February. And so you I remember the... getting there in. Gone. Yeah, no, I was going to say you in, you still caught the old Sharla in Lakshmi Purim, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah the old Sharla. Yeah, goodness me, that was a nightmare. Nightmare that you had to wait two hours to get on the mat. And right. uh, yeah, you know, I was just some scally shit kicker kid from Manchester, you know, and rocked up into India and like, whoa, you know, it, it, it was like a fish out of water. Uh, I remember because we had to get mm. there to to sign sign up, you know, to sign in. And there was a big queue, and I remember this like this black kind of four by four rocked up, tinted windows, and then the window came down, and Pachaba Joyce kind of looked out in in all his bling, and everyone was like, oh. <laughs> that was funny, you know. And then we all signed in, and then we all got our you know wait on those stairs for two hours, and funny. I mean, you know, funny yeah, looking yeah, back yeah. at the time, yeah, it was a bit like, right. really, yeah. Uh so you were kind of skeptical and from the get-go, were you? A little bit of the, well, of the whole I, kind of I, guru I, tradition I thing. Think, you were, you were kind of kissing I, his feet and, think, and. I've got a funny story with that actually, which is right. embarrassing. Which maybe I'll share with you. I guess coming, you know, coming from Manchester, I, I think you have this uh, uh, in uh, inbuilt cynicism <laughs> comes with the yeah, terrorist yeah. part of the Manchester DNA. I'm, you know, you're cynical about things, so it's you know, it's you have to kind of. Yeah, I've always kind of, you know, keep it at arm's length. So when people calling this guy guru and all this kind of like, but a bit like a cult, which I guess it is in some ways, you know, the Ashtanga cult. It's been and, said, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> by, by, by me, <laughs> by, yeah. by others. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, you know, so I'd heard, you you know, you've got to kiss the guru's feet. That's all part of it, you know. So I'd, I waited in line. I went up up into his little office, brr, got my, my, my moolah out, my rupees, my big stack of that, and paid him. And I'm like, right, here's my moment. And I got down and actually kissed his feet because I thought that's what you do. No one's no one explained to me. You just touch his feet and, you you know, the whole thing. I didn't know that, you know. You know, I, you know <laughs> he just looked at me like that. <laughs> thinking, what's going on here? This weird kid just kissing me feet. You, you, know? you actually anyway, made contact. You actually, yeah. you know, properly yeah, but, actually kissed his feet. Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> Right, yeah. embarrassing. Um, Don't tell anyone that. Well, anyway, the, story, yeah. the story's out now. But like, I mean, <laughs> when, when you were there, you know, and practicing, you're obviously feeling better and better, right? And having sure. some, of, you know, some kind of alleviation from from these uh, the, the symptoms you were suffering. Why do you think that was? What What was it about well, the practice that that made you feel different again, or 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 not different, as it were? Well, normal. with depersonalization, it kind mm -hmm. of gets tagged, you know, in with the in with depression and in with mm. anxiety and people would say depressed i'm saying you know i used to say i'm only depressed because i don't feel real because these symptoms are acute and they're awful and then you know consequently because of these uh, acute symptoms I, I had anxiety too but they were like kind of you know side effects of the of the real thing i was you know and that's the problem with depersonalization to this day as i understand it there's no particular cure for it you know they just lump it in with the depression, so they, they, they feed you SSRIs or antidepressants or mm, antipsychotics mm, yeah. for the anxiety stuff. But it was, you know, uh, I guess from a, a purely physical point of view, you know, the anxiety it was creating, the physicality of practice, 
you know, yeah. just ate away at that. So there was yeah. no, you know, yeah. the anxiety would, would feed on energy. And if there was no energy because you'd worn yourself out from, from doing practice, it'd become, you know, less or much like less. And I was like, you're becoming mm -hmm. a little bit more grounded, a little bit more kind of present um, to it rather than trying to run away from it, if that makes sense. It was like, right, okay. You know, in, in some ways, the digging for all these cures exacerbated it, you know. Right. Trying to find well, no, this I magic. Mean... I mean, I heard you talk about this a few times over the years online, and I don't know where, but um, you know, what, what exactly? I'm always curious as to what exactly the kind of strange feelings you're talking about, or what the, the symptoms are of it. Well, they, they say depersonalization. Mm. Uh, everyone can kind of experience it um, right, right. at some point in their life. Um, <clears throat> uh, apparently, it's an evolutionary thing that you know, in times of panic or terror you become depersonalized. So you don't like, you know, if you're going to get run over by a car, you might experience a flash of depersonalization because you, you know, to, to, to soften the blow as it were. So you kind of feel like you're, you it's not you, if that makes sense. And I, I read somewhere that people, students doing exams can have a flash of it as well. Kind of just these kind of high anxiety moments. Uh, and what happens is, you know, it's just like, uh, uh, you know, only lasts, momentarily but with the, the the disorder depersonalization disorder is where you get stuck in that and it goes on you know for weeks and months and very long periods of time and it's it's it's, it's fucking awful it's absolutely awful mm. i can't you know you know because i started mm. which was probably not a great thing you start going online looking reading other people's stories and right you know yeah it's it, it, it's you know after what am i now 53 maybe it started the best part of 25 years plus of of, of, mm. of having this you know mm. it it's it doesn't get any easier to articulate it i guess if mm. you've ever taken mm. drugs and you've ever had a bad trip you could say mm. right you know it's a little bit like that um, right. you know and at the time i i kind of wanted to get to ground zero so i get I, i've stopped drinking i stopped tea or coffee i stopped eating any kind of kind of you know e numbers so all the toffees and the sweets when you know just to, you know, to get to this kind of place where I knew, you know, what was going on. Well, to a certain extent, it, there was, so I didn't want any kind of, you know, like alcohol would affect it, you know, caffeine would affect it, will make it worse, you know, so they stopped. Do you still feel it now? Or did it, or the yoga sort it out? Still, yeah, I, I mean, this is kind of um, really fascinating to me in, in some ways, because, you know, later on when I got to, to, to Zen, studying Zen and, um, you know, this idea of, of emptiness and, you know, there are kind of similarities um, in, in, in what they're talking about and the depersonalization. But before the, um, the first kind of chronic episodes in my, I guess I was about 16 or 17, um, I remember I used to look at myself in a mirror and I would kind of freak myself out i would go into these alternate alternate states of like consciousness which i had no kind of reference point for other than that it was quite spooky it was you know it was a little bit scary and then what i would do i would do it quite often then i would go get my guitar out or put some records on you know to get back into being me and at the time I, you know when i was looking back on that with the depersonalization i thought oh maybe that was depersonalization and you know or mm. uh, the first mm. kind of signs of it Mm. But um, just kind of this last year, I've been getting into the um, the Advaita, the Advaita stuff. Well, yeah, we'll come, I, we'll, we'll come to that. We'll come to that. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah, uh, yeah. got a book by Stephen. You've heard of Stephen Badayan? Is it Stephen Badayan? I haven't. Heard no, him? actually, I have, he no, used I to be. Um, no. He was a, the editor of uh, Yoga Journal for ten years. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and so I got one of his books. Because I listened to a few, he, he was a, he was in a Zen monastery for ten years and packed it in because it was that was happening, <laughs> basically. And then right. he, you know, he was uh, he started following Jean Klein. I don't know if you've heard of him, Jean Klein. I have heard of Jean yeah, Klein. Yeah, and I know I I meant I've I've heard you mention Rupert Spira, who we've had on the podcast. I've interviewed Rupert. Um, okay, nice. Is, uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah a... I um so Stephen Bedine would had this experience from going to a Jean Klein uh, workshop or whatever. Anyway, so I've got one of these Timber Dine books. And, mm. You know, about a third of the way through, he talks about when he was in his teens or late teens, he was he was able to 
uh, look at himself in the in, in the mirror exactly the same and go into this kind of you know this state of oneness of consciousness or uh, you know mm. whatever and I'm, I'm reading that thinking you know that's what i did really you know it's just exactly the same but in in my mind mm. i just kind of my reference point was the depersonalization i kind of you know just thought they were one of the same thing but I, it's it's hard to know really it's just it's like kind of like on the other side of the fence, right? Like there's there's one experience which is a kind of oneness, right? And then there's the other experience which is a kind of a, an awful feeling of of not being there, right? But they're, they're kind of like almost well, guess... two sides of the same coin. One one is potentially a very pleasant, liberating feeling. The other is a, a kind of frightening feeling, right? Of of not being present. It depends which way maybe you can kind of which aspect exactly, you have towards yeah. it. Mm. There's, there's... Through the Stephen Bedayan he uh, book, you know, when you read a book and they always mention another book, you think, right, I'll go get that one. And I think I think she's called Susan Sarandon. And it was her, I mean, it's, she's since passed away. I think it was, that was her name. But she, her book, I can't remember it, sorry. But she goes into details about having this experience, which sounds exactly the same as depersonalization, but was later to find a teacher who was able to kind of, articulate and uh, and bring her through it and then she became a kind of a advisor teacher in her own right you know so back to that late teen thing and i was doing this stuff in the mirror i had no kind of reference points for it other than you know at the time i guess I, i'd been I'd, I'd started smoking pot at that point pot weed whatever you call it <laughs> and you know i'd done some magic mushrooms so that was my only kind of reference point was you know was it something to do with that or not? I, I, I never for one moment thought it had any kind of, you know, uh, spiritual, I didn't even know what spirituality was or, or, or being spiritual or practice or any of those things, really. Um, yeah. But did you, look at, did you look at the yoga in a spiritual sense? I mean, it sounds like you, I mean, from, from what you say, you know, in a, in a limited oh, um, understanding of, yeah. of, of did, I mean, because, you you know, you, you're doing a traditional type of yoga, you're going to Mysore, you know, you're getting your authorization, whatever, right? I mean, it kind of leads me to wonder how how to, kind of traditional you, you took the method, I mean, you know, what, what you kind of think about that, right? And and this kind of lineage per se, you know, what, what's your kind of take on that? How how spirit how spiritual is yoga, is, is yes, Ashtanga yoga for you? That, that, that yeah, word yeah. tradition and the mm, used now mm, i kind of thought it should be that mm. they should rephrase it and call it trend rather than tradition because <laughs> the you know because the trend is you know because the practice seems to change and, and and you know it's like well the tradition is this well i think you know the trend is to do this these days because it kind of gets changed and evolves mm. or, or whatever so but sorry back to your original question i guess you know from a very simple layman's point of view you know um the, the, the practice you know it made me feel better. Simply mm, yeah. that. And when I yeah, felt better, yeah. I felt like I was a better person, better person to myself, better person to other, better person to other people, you mm. know, and from that very simple, simplistic, you know, do good and be good, you know, can that be construed as spiritual to know? But for me, that, that, that's what it was. Mm, and mm. Um, I, I guess all the, the books around it, the spirit, you know, the yoga sutras, the Bhagavad Gita and stuff, I, 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 I never gelled with them at all. Um, I just found certainly the sutras quite dry, impenetrable. Uh, and I guess having this brain yes, that jumps around, I, could, I couldn't not get... Not a fun text. No, it, <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt yeah. a bit like an imposter, you know, because you go to my story and like, have you read the Gita? Have you read the sutras? <laughs> you know, it's a, a prerequisite to becoming an Ashtanga. Yeah, you can do those fancy Dan Poshes, but you've got to read the books. And I just, you know, I, 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 I just, I just couldn't get with them. And it was well, like, I think you know, it's a bit of a confusion life. in a certain way, because, um, you know, I mean, it's a, if we're doing something which is, has its roots in potentially working with the body in a tantric sense, right? So you're mechanistically man manipulating the body and there's the energy in the body, it, you know, it speaks volumes, you know, you don't need to necessarily know what you're doing with your head to do certain movements to change that energy yeah. in the body. I mean, you know, it's also had, um, strong anxiety symptoms at university. That's why I started as well. And nothing, I mean, I did philosophy, so nothing in that study of philosophy, which is why I did philosophy as well, just trying to solve these issues, you know, nothing in that yeah. ever really changed anything until I went into the yoga class and I started doing something with the body because I thought, you know what, like it's an energy that's in the very body. It's not in the head. It's not in my thoughts. I mean, what's happening is that those thoughts are being thrown up onto the, you know, onto the 
screen of the mind, if you want, from the energy of the body. So something maybe is, is, can be manipulated like a mechanics kind of garage in the body. And that might change the thoughts to kind of more, more uh, calm, pleasanter kind of experience of self, you know. And, you know, is it, I didn't need to read anything about yoga. And I didn't do that for years. I, I guess, as I mentioned before, I'd always been fairly mm. fit in that mm. I football. I only understood the, the, the um, you know, the benefits of being fit and staying healthy and eating well right. and stuff. You know, I right. always understood that. No, I, I never did that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a terrible and I, diet well, and, I guess and kind of, yeah. I really. Yeah. Well, yeah. Smoking and drinking and eating just I think I thought well, I McDonald's was a healthy guess... healthy meal. You know? You got your meat and you got your you got your carbs and you know, yeah, yeah. No, I, I so I mean for me it was just like literally just like feeling fitter and healthier. Just sure. was night and day for the symptoms, to be honest. I mean a lot of it was just feeling physically good. You kind of almost kind of by default kind of you know tricked the mind into feeling mentally better because you felt physically mm. better you know so yeah well back to that cliche you know mind and body two sides of the same coin you fit in the, in the body apparently, you fit in the apparently mind, so you know? apparently. <laughs> yeah well. um right so i mean but you know more recently you've you've become quite interested in in more uh you know say I don't know how to, I don't want to say spiritual practices, but other practices other than just uh, the so, physical, right? So, uh, right. Well, do you want, do you want to mention, mention your, your Zen interest? And yeah, the, so the Zen thing came stuff. about from, um, you know, I, I, I kind of didn't make head the tail of the sutras. Ditto Bhagavad Gita, really. I mean, I, I make this kind of rather ten, tenuous connection in that, you know, they uh, certainly with the Bhagavad Gita talking about all these fanciful stories and etc. And they didn't feel real. They didn't, you know, they didn't mm. feel that they kind of, you know, um, back to that depersonalization. I needed real things, not yeah. Not they're not exactly fanciful yeah, stories. They're not exactly you know? modern, are they? You know, it's like set in a yeah, medieval just, battle battlefield. Um, Yes, it's slightly arcane. You don't really have chariot around these days. Um, yeah, hundred yeah, percent. We're, we're, we're not really likely to be fighting a war, you know, where we, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, but no, I mean, it's, it's, it's yeah, well, yeah, exactly, yeah. Well, at least not a medieval war, probably. But you know, it's a, you have to do a bit of mental gymnastics to see the meta to, to approach the metaphor in a in a modern context. It, it, you know, which yeah. latterly latterly can be done. But you know, I was definitely thought it was a mu for, for years. I thought it was a musty old text and. Uh, and not very very applicable. Well, it to, just had it had no relevance yeah. to, yeah, to me to, to modern to, life, to, me. to current life. Yeah. Exactly. And so anyway, I I'd, um, I was on Amazon, and and this is this is a true story. And I can't remember what book I bought, but you know that section. If you bought this book, you might like this book. And up mm, pop this mm. book called Hardcore Zen. I don't know if, if you've come across a guy called yeah, Brad, Brad Warner. Warner. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, an interesting yeah. guy. Yeah. yeah, and that yeah. came up, and you know the um, the, the, the 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 cliche never book judge a book by its cover. I, I literally bought it because the cover was 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 great. You know, I had this kind of Buddha with a Mohican and hardcore <laughs> Zen, that kind of, you know. So I bought this book and it, you know, um, uh, it was a real page turner. Uh, it, I just literally, it kind of sp spoke to me in, in so many ways that because it felt relevant. There was this guy, similar age, you know, and obviously the stories weren't the same. But, and yeah, it just, you know, and this very simple practice of, you know, sitting still you know with the eyes open looking at the wall but basically the whole thing based around a practice and mm. i'd already established myself in the discipline of practice through ashtanga you know yeah so yeah, it's, exactly. it was like right mm, okay mm. i get this you this is something i can do it's a practice mm, mm. yeah and i would just you know i started sitting 10 15 20 minutes you know i reached out to brad did you reconnected yeah, yeah. and what was it about the Ashtanga practice you felt was kind of lacking that you needed to do another practice? I'm not saying that that's not the case yeah, for many people, but what, what was it that, yeah, it wasn't a kind of adequate? I guess it, mm. it's, it's back to the, 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 the search, you know, it felt like, you know, there was a, a, a part, whether you want to call that spiritual or not, perhaps you could use that word, that because I, I wasn't finding it so much in, 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 the, the sutras and the Bhagavad Gita and, you know, the asana practice was, was great for my body and it, and it helped keep me physically fit and, you know, it was helping calm my mind. But I guess there was just a thirst for something else, a and other. Um, 
to, to, to connect to um, this, you know, again, basically, I mean, I like what Brad, Brad says, you know, he, he basically writes books about sitting and looking at a wall because <laughs> fundamentally that's what, that's what it is. The Shikantaza Soto Zen practice, you know, mm. it's all about the postures, staying still, you know, eyes open, lowered. And there were so many similarities, you know, the eyes are open. There's a, there's a, you know, they don't, don't call it a drishti, but your eyes are mm. open and, you, and they're fixed. And there was, you know, the, the, the drishti and it's a posture. I'm used to doing postures, um, you know, and the, uh, and the repetition, the daily practice. I was used, used to that. And so there was a kind of an effortlessness of just adding it in. Uh, to, it kind to, of com complements the practice. Yeah, yeah, for right. sure. I mean, right. interestingly enough, I, I um, you know, it, it, in a very simple way, you could say, Yoga is the means and meditation is the end. You know, you're, you're, these asanas are preparing you for longer periods in meditation, prayer, contemplation, yeah. whatever. I think that's been said before, hasn't it? By yeah, a few times. Uh, more times with people and Patanjali than me. and, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and so what, what is it you're feeling, um, you know, when you're doing these practices, what kind of headway are you making with these practices that perhaps you didn't, you know, didn't feel well, in, in the uh, physical? Well, I guess what what happened is um, I I I I'd always do the Zen practice after the uh, the asana the after the ashtanga, mm. and mm. I, I I flipped it on its head purely by chance where I I don't know what the circumstance was for me that day you know a few years back but I did my sitting practice first and then you know I did the asana practice and then all of a sudden I felt wow because of the the the, the my mind was a little bit more steady that the practice mm. became far more embodied far more engaged my mind was was running away less and it was like wow they, you know it just felt like these practices just knitted together perfectly you know mm. to create mm. this the, the, you know this perfect mind body i guess mm. Mm. that stillness mm. and that 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 you know it's i guess it's hard to articulate a little bit um I, I guess it's coming back to you know I'd started these practice because I was had these this this, this you know this mental this depersonalization problem. Mm, it's always mm. been about you know wanting to get uh, find some sense of stillness from you know whatever tools I've got at my disposal and mm. it seemed the Ashtanga thing happened and really helped mm. and the and the Zen thing that the, the, this this seated meditation practice they mm, just mm. felt like the perfect bedfellows and you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it also makes me think of um, the people listening who've also suffered from, you know, anxiety and, and mental health. You know, and I put my hand on my heart and say, me included. I mean, what what else? What else? Can you say anything else about your experience? What's helped it? What hasn't? With the yoga well, practice, you know, uh, any way great, you've I, used the practice, or the food, I, or the I, diet? Yeah, anything. Great way to, um, you know, a great way. Because you know we're we're lost in our heads, whether it's anxiety, mm. whether it's depression, whether it's you know a great way of getting out of the head is getting into the body, mm. you know, and uh, you know you, you you're certainly not thinking about woe is me when you're doing navasana five times and for five breaths, you know. What happens if you're too anxious? I mean, people will say I'm too anxious or depressed to practice. I mean, did you not have that feeling in the at least in the early days? Like, well, I can't you know, get I, on my I, mat. I'm just having too much panic in me, you know. I guess if you can do Surya Namaskar, you know, right. you just start off, do Surya Namaskar, one, eight, eight, you know, nine movements, whatever, and you do two the next day, and you just set yourself, you know, baby steps, just take it a, a, a little bit at a time. You know, I, I guess for me, like I mentioned uh, a few months yeah, ago, yeah. I, I felt that throwing myself into practice was eating up the kind of the anxiety right. around it. So, you so know, it was kind of easy it, for you. You didn't struggle getting into it. You didn't have any no, struggle at all. getting on really okay so the anxiety kind of led you to it in a way for sure yeah, yeah but right, I, I mean right. i completely understand I, you know at that moment there's no chance i would have been able to do the zen thing right know? there's no chance right. i could have just be, be sitting still looking at a wall i don't you yeah. know I didn't, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't have i, I wasn't yeah. ready for that it was like and i think i heard yeah. you say on another podcast as well that i mean you know people often say well you know the ashtanga it's a uh, you know, it's injury based. It's uh, it's always a uh, you know, it's competitive. It's always looking forward. The you know, the sequences encourage this kind of act, a kind of aggressive pushing and ego. But I mean, you know, as you rightly pointed out, you need a little bit of that first of all. Otherwise, you know, that that anxiety, it needed something to kind of draw into, right? Like to to kind of chase, right? I mean, it would, it would, you say that's oh, a yeah. fit. 
a fairer synopsis of your experience, right? That the sequences and the, and the, the, the you know, I mean, obviously a little bit older now. I, I'm amazed you're 53, but you, Matt's 53. Uh, but, you know, over the years, you know, you and I will both be chasing the postures and that somehow was it was a valid distraction at the time you know as much as oh, we can say we can say to younger st younger students oh don't chase the postures oh it's not about the postures but you know it, it, it you know it helped uh, you know uh, yeah i mean it helped it helped take things away from mental narcissism and distraction of one's own anxieties and worries in a way right the, the, you know the the, the the chasing after postures had a slightly different lens in that you know when i was got into the practice and I thought, and then I was introduced, oh, this is a second series and there's these third series, da, da, da. And I guess because it was more physical and, and, and harder work, you know, it was for me that, that, that my mind was like, right, if I do them, I'm going to feel even better. Mm. Does that make sense? So, mm. you know, I mean, I guess it, 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 I guess it was true a little bit, but, you know, not so much now these days, but you know, got, getting older, don't do it as much. But at the time, yeah. it was like, right, you know. So I had a thirst for the practice. I was relatively youngish, early thirties, and I kind of, you know, right, I'll get into this, I'll get into that, because this is gonna, you know, this is gonna really sort me out. This is gonna sort me out once and for all. And you know, um, yeah. So it also gave a sense, I, of, know, there's a sense of optimism, isn't there, when you see something in the future? Oh, you know, feeling good, and you can see all this stretched in the future, and you just think, well, that's gonna be better and better, and it. You know, in a sense, it's kind of it gives you that hope in the present, which does make you feel better. You know. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, you you have to have a little bit of fire in your belly to get on the mat. I think. You know, uh, and the way that that fire manifests, or you know, it, it evolves whether you're doing legs behind head or whatever you're doing. I think practice. Yeah. You know. But I think also something has to, for most people, something has to be slightly felt unsatisfactory, to say the least, if not, you know, a certain degree of suffering to get on the mat early in the morning, especially in the Northern Hemisphere countries, you know, where it's not really exactly inviting cold, to get wet, up. damp and yes, dark, and that's yeah. on a good day, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, and better, obviously, you're in the LA and area, and it would have been a bit easier to get up in the morning and start, you know, moving around. But, you know, and especially for us in Europe in the winter, you know. I'm actually not there right now for, for, for that reason. Um, <laughs> um, you know, it's hard. It's, you know, it's hard. And, and you need that degree of suffering in daily life to remind you to kind of, you know, do something for yourself in a way. If everything was great, you know, I often say that about Southern European countries, you know, like who haven't had this, such a strong tradition of Ashtanga. It's too, life is too good. I mean, you go out for a little bit of tapas in the evening and a glass of wine, you know, and it's, you know, but um, I think you know, have to have a little bit of uh, disgruntledness, to say the least, to, you know, to, to make yeah. you do something, to do something, which is, you know, it's not immediately what the first thing you think about when you get up, at least, you know, like, you don't, oh, no. like, like I think like David Swenson said, even David Swenson saying this, you know, you don't jump out of bed and think, oh, Ashtanga, yes, please, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, like, and if he's saying that, you know, you know, then. I think we all have a right to say it. What about your, what about your teaching then? What, how, how, you know, obviously you, you, you taught for many years now and you've taught also in many places. I mean, you started Yoga Manchester and then I know you moved to LA to, to US for, for a couple of years and now you're back again in England. Um, do you want to talk a bit the, the your trajectory of teaching that, um, you know, anything that sticks out, how it may be, how, how you've uh, um, changed your teaching or, or developed your teaching over the years? Back from, uh, from Mysore that first time, mm. and, you know, it was like, you know, I, I, I basically did two months there, and I got back, and, and you know, I had a, a few hard decisions to make. You know, do I get a job? Do I go back into nightclub? No way that was going to happen. Or do I start teaching yoga without any real qualifications? And mm. you know, I guess in the end, it was an easy choice. And you know, through the nightclubs because um, I used to do PR and stuff as well. I managed to get a whole bunch of people to my, my first class. I mean, my first class was in a place in, in, called Heaton Moor in Stockport, and I, and I specifically chose that uh, because I had my sisters there, so I'm thinking, right, at least my sisters are going to come and my sister's mates are going to come to that first class. It's always, you know, <laughs> there's a tip yeah. for you if you just start. You always choose a place yeah. where you've got family and friends to come to. Um, yeah. You know, and I, at first class, there's always people there, and I had, I had no concept of how to teach. I just did primary series, you know. And nearly did it along with everybody. them? Oh, did you do it with them? No, or, I just taught. I guess right, you just, I just you taught, taught it. it yeah, yeah, right, I right. taught it through, really. Did, and and did, know, 
did the anxiety come up at that point? I mean, you know, because you were suffering. I mean, or were you, were you fine in teaching? I, in I, was, terms of... I was all right. I guess because you're right, in the pro right. of the teaching, right, and, right, you right. know, in the the metronomic Aikam inhaled right, and all that kind of thing. Right. Uh, you know that that certainly helped. Um, so yeah, that that class became two, and then you know that I started a class in a different area, and slowly, you know, these building, you know, we didn't, I didn't have a center. I just taught you know as i mentioned before a nice business model i just hired a church hall and a school hall and a dance hall in different parts of the south manchester area mm, you know mm. and this is how it was done at the time right there were no yoga centers back in you know no, really in no. 2000 ish right like, yeah and then I, I i built that up and eventually it became yoga manchester I started inviting david williams came david swenson came you know which were helped to put us on the map a little bit and, mm, and mm. then I started my Yoga Express classes, which was basically I nicked from David Swenson. You know, David Swenson's short forms. Mm, mm, mm. I just, you know, and I found a, a, a dance studio in the city centre Manchester and called it Yoga Express and did these 45 minute classes for people to do in the lunchtime or pre work, mm, mm. you know. So I had this kind of I had Yoga Manchester, Yoga Express. And then my wife at the time got transferred to LA. And so we're like, right, okay. So I, I continued to run these these Yoga Manchester Yoga Express and off, I went off to LA and I wasn't teaching the first time because we were there twice. Unbelievable. Right. So we were there mm. twice. Half the first time, uh, Lena got pregnant and so we had to come back. Or well, we didn't have to, but it was going to be like a whole load of money to have a, a baby out there. So when we moved back, we lived in London, lived in Walthamstow. And right. through some friends of hers, they had a little space over in West Hampstead. So I set up a little studio in West Hampstead called Yoga, Yoga London Club, only very small, 12 people. And like within maybe three weeks of that opening, we decided to move back to Manchester. <laughs> so now I had this little studio that I was running in London, but I wasn't teaching there, which as a business model is crap because it's only a small studio. You've got to pay teachers to do the classes, you know. How was it, how was it, how was it teaching in LA compared to Manchester? Because I know you were very successful in Manchester and, and you know, Manchester has been going on all this time, you know, like off and on, I think, even without you there, well, right? I mean, you built so up a big, a big thing in the north of England through, with Ashanga. When we moved back to Manchester and then we mm. went back to L.A. for the second time, I was then I, I then had a, a, a proper teaching gig running a MySol program in, right. in the west side. And yeah. I, I, you know, people love me out there. <laughs> I was going to say, how, how do they react to a no, you know, man, I think because, man, you know, yeah, scally with an yeah, accent? Man, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, they like that. I think, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think yeah, they yeah. like the, the kind of the realness of me, if that makes yeah. sense. You know. Oh yes, yes. Um, you know, yeah. that's always been my kind of USP: normal bloke does yoga. <laughs> yeah. Type yeah, of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's, I, 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 that's just who I am, I, I, and you know, people loved it. I remember one guy calling me that the hardest man in a Mysore room. You know. Because I, I, I just like to help people, I guess. I love, yeah. you know, I guess that's what I get out of teaching. I love helping people. I love people kind of, you know, getting something from practice, you know. Mm. Um, uh, and so, you know, then, so that that was great. It was, I guess, of all my teaching life, those few years in, in L.A. were, were great. Because I was teaching, you know, this traditional format of Ashtanga yoga, this Mysore style thing, I, mm. you know which I guess in some ways all Ashtanga teachers aspire to a little bit. Or maybe certainly I, I do and did. And so I was doing that. Yeah. I mean, as you mentioned, it's easier to yeah. get out of bed in, in LA, right, to come and practice. So numbers were always good. And then the, um, the the pandemic came and that stopped and then we moved back. And then, you know, I've been living in, in, in Kent for the last kind of 12, right, no, south two of England. years really. Yeah, yeah. right. And okay. It, You're teaching down it, there? Well, it was all on Zoom, you know, right. like everybody everybody else, which has been, you know, kind of okay. It, it, it helped, I guess. And then, but now I'm at a stage where I am about, because basically the uh, the pandemic closed down, the little studio in London, the Yoga Express, the Yoga Manchester things. Uh, I, I'm now, I'm, I, I'm going back to Manchester. My right. plan is to, yeah. to get back up to Manchester to relaunch Yoga Manchester, put it back on the map. We've got a beautiful studio in the city centre. That's going to happen. Um, in Fantastic. January, I think. Right okay, in January. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm super in, in, excited about it, Adam, to be honest yeah, with you. Because, I, I mean, I said, I've still, there's still a bunch of students who have put up with my dad jokes all these years and <laughs> they're, 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 they want to. 
come back, you know, and then I, wanting to reach out. I mean, Manchester is crazy now, you know, the amount of um, apartment blocks that have gone up in the city centre. There's all these thousands and thousands of people living in the city centre. I think, um, you know, like the north of England has become more and more attractive, for, you know, for, for all people, right, as, you know, somewhere that's more, you know, affordable and, you know, got a lot going for it now in terms of housing and jobs and, you know, in, in a way that maybe, you know, it's developed a lot, right? So, you know, I when I was in the UK, a... we, yeah, the BBC, Manchester, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, we, you know, we even we, we were thinking for leaving London at one point, we are thinking of Birmingham or Manchester or, you know, maybe, you know, somewhere up there, Sheffield, Leeds. Um, well, I think you'll do. I think you'll do. <laughs> but your wife said no. <laughs> well, we, we, yeah, we looked, we looked, but we, we decided Bali was a uh, well, maybe maybe uh, a different... <laughs> Manchester Bali. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We decided, we decided on Bali. But I mean, what would you describe for the students then, just to get trying to get more of a feel of, of the way you teach? How would you describe the way you teach? Or I mean, you know, you're teaching this traditional system, but as I've kind of kind of tried to kind of get at before, you're not really that kind of bloke that you know is a kind of traditional yoga teacher, you know, no. and, and you're, you're, you know, you're coming from a really quite a raw place, I think, which I really like, you know, mm. of your own experience, of your own experience of yoga, basically just literally helping you, you know, without any kind of philosophical overlay or ideology. So when other students are coming to you and as a teacher and saying, well, what are we, you know, what are we trying to aim for here psychologically? Or what are we doing? You know, like, I mean, I kind of, you know, like, as we all get to at a certain point, right, I like this practice, it makes me feel better. But what does it mean? You know, like, what am I doing? You know, how do you answer those kind of questions? Well, not very sim simplistic. As I mentioned before, you know, you do this practice, you're going to you feel good. And, and then if you, in my eyes, if you're feeling good, you're better. But you're just a better person all around to yourself, to other people. Mm. And, you know, and if people, I guess, are starting to immerse themselves in, in the practice and, the, the, you know, they, 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 they want to take that, that further, you know, I've just given say, yeah, I'll read. Read this. Give them the Gita. <laughs> I can oh, make my head say, but maybe you can. <laughs> you tell me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I come, send them to Luke like Jordan. Yeah. I say, listen, oh, yeah. if you want to know more about that, go off to see that fella. <laughs> He'll sort you out. Yeah, you know, he's, he, uh, he knows a thing or two. Um, so, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Right, so, but I, I, I guess it is that you know the way I teach is I want to be as you know available as as possible to mm. to, to that student specific you know wants needs goals perhaps you know i want to try and allow that you know all those things to be realized yeah and i how guess does that, you know even say, from djing the... days i guess right. that story just to go in you know yeah, yeah. you're djing you're making people happy making people mm. feel good it's it's, mm. it's the same thing i used to be right. in bands you know in in 1805 uh, you know it's that kind of not performance but i guess in some ways it is you're just wanting to put a smile on people's faces right you know that that it's, it's that simple i guess mm. how does the pedagogy fit in the the kind of structure and we talked about tradition and you called it a trend i mean but i mean are you a traditional teacher i mean how much do you think that's important to follow this what can be interpreted as a, as a rigid system which is you know which you know which the teacher can then be kind of framed as the enforcer of this uh you know this kind of uh rather linear yeah, and kind well, of rather narrow kind of window of, of uh, practice and, and progression, right? You can't do this, you can't go any further, you can't do this, you can't do that. I mean, how, how do you, how do you, uh, how do you put yourself in this, in the, in this, uh, in this role? Yeah, how I you, mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's a whole bit of a, a kind of a shit show, isn't it, really? And it, it, in that, you know, the idea that you can't go beyond Navasana until you're binding in Mari Chasana D. Um, you know, personally, I think it's nonsense. You know, <laughs> for for what reasons? If if someone can give me other than a kind of a, a bullshit, well, it's good for the ego, you know, to tame it and all that. Really, you know, certainly, um, you know, you want you want your beginners doing Bada Konasana. You want your, your beginners doing Upavishta Konasana. Uh, and if you know, there's there's ways and means of approaching your marriage Chasana's way. Well, you know, you're a teacher. It's, I think oh, the, the, the problem totally is, agree. you know, yeah. people are looking at the practice. Well, I, you know, we're all different. The way I look at it is I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, it's, it's for me, it's about the student and their journey and how can I fulfill that in the best way possible? You know, I, I, you know, this is as cosmic as I get, you know, I don't want to be the guru. I want to awaken the guru inside the student. So mm. they start to understand the practice. They understand the, the, the body and, 
you know, that this idea of I, I, I say to students, I say, you know, who come through the door, I say, you, you know, getting your legs behind your head isn't is, is, is basically advanced flexibility. Right. That's all it is when you look at it through that lens. And advanced yoga and yoga as in the, the, the asana practice is, is, you know, understanding your body, its body's limitations, what it can and can't do, understanding this posture here, mm. making them mm. two things fit together, you know, and the, mm. the repetition, you know, I, 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 I reframe David Swenson word that, you know, the modification, because I guess in some way it, it, there's a negative connotation around using that word. Yeah, we don't really use that word anymore. Yeah. You can't say yeah, modification. Say, you, you have know, to say uh, variation or something. Yes, yeah, like that. I yeah, just, yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm yeah, saying yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. You're not modifying I'd anything. I call it a modified. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And um, you know, your variations change. The more you, you, the more you practice, you'll get, you know. Well, your, I think there's, an, yeah. and there's just yeah. There's a kind of an essence of a posture, isn't there? And you can do that to differing degrees depending on, you know, course, natural 100%. ability and how much, how much effort you put in and then your natural predisposition right but you know, everyone can do that and get the same kind of essence of the, the, the posture in terms of you know muscles engagement and you know energetic stimulation if you want to go there um now what's your i'm just kind of wrapping this interview up now i suppose what, what's your being your biggest challenge with it with the asana practice at least with the yoga like i mentioned before that you that maybe you found it challenging to get on the mat in the first place i found it incredibly challenging with my uh, mental health you know i told you to get on the mat i had to, really had to make myself get on the mat for the for the first years um uh, but you, you seem to not have a struggle with that what's been your biggest no, struggle I yeah. Um, yeah i i guess the i wouldn't call it a struggle i mean you know i'm 53 now i i don't do the crazy shit that i used to do you know it kind mm. of has a different meaning for me now and you know, I, I will always aim to sit, you know, I'll get up at five, up at five, six o'clock, depending on what time the kid's waking up, you know, mm. uh, and I'll sit, I'll always sit every day, I'll always sit. And then I will, you know, depending uh, what's happening for me that day, I, I, I will I will practice. And I guess in, in some ways, you know, I, I some days I don't get to practice and, I, I you know, it's a case of, well, that's it. It's at one right. stage I've been, I, I, if I couldn't have practiced on, on a day, I'd be like, you know, be gutted you know i would find right. that you know really uh, a bit of a challenge not being able to practice but these days i guess you know just kind of letting go in a way let, you know? yeah yep. which is a lesson in, in and of itself right to be able to let yeah. go not to kind of have that attachment to practice yeah uh, you have you found it hard to kind of tone down your practice and let go of some of the postures has that been a, well, no know? because that's kind of happened yeah. quite naturally you know right. through through body that the you know when we were in la in the first lockdown and um, we lived in this tiny um, shoebox of an apartment. You know, the kids there, we couldn't go out. They locked all the beaches and stuff. And so I started going out doing a lot. I just go, I used to run every day, you know. And so my asana practice took a, a back seat because you, you can't do, you know, it's hard to do practice. We've got two kids running around, um, mm. you know, because they're just, they were just young kids, right? So I just started doing a lot of running, you know. So uh, that affected my asana practice and that was all right i just accepted this was what, what was going on mm. uh, and now kind of you know a couple of years on two and a half years on it's like i, I i'm really happy with where i'm at with what i'm doing mm. obviously i've stopped running i've just got back into into practice I'm trying to open those hips again <laughs> yeah oh it's like why is it so hard to do my charles and d now you know uh, yeah. yeah and yeah, yeah. Uh, i i guess having kind of those those little niggles that just seem to go away the next day that that, that doesn't happen anymore those kind of, yeah. little, kind of little pains and things they seem to linger a lot mm. longer <laughs> mm. you know so yeah. I, I, i'm i'm just you know trying to find the the right fit knowing right. that that fit can change from from week to week from month to month you know i'm, I'm basically just focused on primary series i did second series last week for the first time in a couple of weeks couple of months perhaps even and it felt, it felt it was a bit it was a bit shabby, but it felt all right. But the next next day, it felt like I'd been beaten up, you know. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I was like, oh, fuck, what am I doing this for? You know. And I, you know. But then, you know, I'll say, maybe I'll do it again next week, or maybe I won't. <laughs> where do you, you know, see yourself as... going? Where do you see yourself going in the future with the yoga practice, or do you see yourself doing more meditation, or you know, is there any, you know, uh, how do you see the trajectory of the whole whole thing in your teaching? Where would you see yourself I, in 10, 10, 15 I guess years? I will always maintain some kind of practice. Right. I felt right. personally for me, I, you know, I would feel the a fraud didn't if I didn't it. practice. Mm, yeah, mm. I, I need to practice to be able to teach, you know, that feels like, you know, 
a, a prerequisite for me. But I guess I, I will always maintain a practice for, for sure. And I feel I've, I've got this nice balance um, of kind of, you know, this, this Zen thing and this Asana thing. You know, I'll keep doing that as, as, as long as I can, right? Mm, you know, mm. See where that goes. And I'll, uh, I'll hopefully turn into that wise old teacher that people still want to come to rather than, you know, the guy the guy in the lycra teaching vinyasa flow <laughs> who knows maybe i'll have to okay. start driving for amazon <laughs> yeah. all right to wrap it up one guilty pleasure and one inspiration all right don't think too hard um we've had a lot of guilty pleasures um i think me and mark roberts bonded over uh, emily in paris on netflix um don't say, just don't say just don't say chocolate um and then, yeah, and then one, and then uh, yeah, and then one inspiration, um, something that inspires you, um, can be a person, place, or anything. Yeah. Mm, yeah, it's guilty pleasure. I was going to say white chocolate, but I'm not going to say that. Ah, I tell you, you what, I tell you what, you know, banned. I guess this yeah. couldn't really be considered as a, as a guilty pleasure, but it's become one a little bit. Coffee. I've not drunk coffee. You know, oh. as I mentioned, but I gave up tea, coffee, alcohol a long, long right, time ago. Right. Yeah, and. Maybe 10 years ago, I used to hang out with a mate and his wife was, um, sorry, it's a long story. His wife was Chinese and she was, was offering me green tea. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't drink green tea. I don't drink anything. And then eventually I relented and I started drinking this green tea and I got right into green tea. I became a, a green tea anorak. I started importing it, you know, these, these, these oolongs from this right. guy in, in Taiwan. And then when I was teaching with Luke in, in, in Tenerife at Easter, I forgot to take the tea with me and he was like, here, here, have a little bit of this coffee. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, okay. You know, so I was having this um, little espresso in the morning, four in the morning. I was like, oh, this is actually quite nice. And then, you yeah, know, from that point, it must, on, must have been. Do, yeah, yeah. Doing these little coffees in the morning, I'm quite enjoying it, you know, thinking, you know, at one stage that would give me a panic attack. <laughs> it's, it's fine now, you know, just in the morning. It must be a different world. If you haven't had it for long, it's like, oh, this is what it's like to practice yeah. being a bit more awake. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I, I guess I guess this is really not a, a, an inspiration either. But going back to Manchester and reconnecting with friends and family, right? Uh, and being, can I be inspired by Manchester? Maybe you know, being back there now. When I go back there now, I just feel wow. You know, back being back home, having these 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 students, um, my family and friends being there. Mm, you know, wow, mm. just just feel that bit, the energy of the place. Yeah. Do you connect you with know. the mu the music scene still? Are you any? You oh know, yeah, you I was kind of peripherally in involved yeah. in, the, yeah. in, in the music scene as well. You know, through the DJing and, and stuff, and yeah, but, yeah, and I still got kind of mates within that. So, mm. right, Manchester yeah. is my inspiration. Okay, well, <laughs> we're looking forward to seeing what's going to go on there in the future for you. So yeah. Everyone, yeah, just keep, keep your eyes posted. peeled for uh, Yoga Manchester resurrected and coming back in the new year. All right. So thank you, Matt, for coming on. It's been a pleasure and a, a joy to, yeah, to have a little you. chat with you. I hope All I right. was um, kind of articulate yeah. enough for people to make sense. I say Absolutely. that, you know, you can tell I'm from, I'm from Manchester by my complete lack of sophistication. <laughs> Not at all. Very, very real and very down to earth and exactly the kind of guest that I like. So thank you. Yeah.